Well hello again everybody. Now this is just going to be hopefully a quick video talking about these ceramic insulators that are damaged and a few people have been offering me some advice and uh, previously we was discussing what material we could make these out of. Now what I said in one of the previous videos was that I was looking for an engineering plastic that we could use and a few suggestions have come in and one of them is a Teflon which uh, to be honest I'd forgotten about and I think that's quite a good suggestion. Now I did look into the material properties for Teflon and from what I can see the maximum temperature is about 325 degrees and uh, I don't know how hot these actually get. I suspect that these uh, insulators on the end probably don't get as hot as some of the other parts because the actual heating element doesn't actually pass through the insulator it actually just attaches to this bolt here at the top whereas the uh, these other coiled heat parts of the heating element they actually pass through the uh, through the ceramic so I'm sure they get even hotter uh, but I don't know what the operating temperature will be but I suspect it could well exceed you know 300 and odd degrees so I'm actually thinking that we need to actually replace these with some new ceramic insulators now I had a quick look on eBay and it does look as though there is various types of ceramics that are available. Uh, nothing quite in the size that we need, but that isn't to say we couldn't adapt something. And very kindly, one of my subscribers, Joe, said that he had a, a little bit of time free and uh, you know he, he could probably have a Google round and have a look for me. I'm kind of thinking though that if you guys just stop what you're doing now and go and have a route round in, the, in your shed, if you're anything like me, you've probably got some quality streak uh, tins or some old shag tobacco tins that were probably your granddad's. Well, if you go and have a route round in them tins, the ones that you don't open very often, if you're anything like me, you'll have a collection of this type of stuff. You know the things that you take out of equipment because you think uh, it might be useful to you one day. Now, I've actually been and had a look through my shag tobacco tins and, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'm, I'm all out of these ceramics. But what I thought we'd do is we'll take this one off just have a look at how it's assembled and uh, you know it might give you an idea of what we need to replace it with. These ceramics are kind of bobbin shaped and we'll have a close look when we take one off but it looks as though basically you feed the, the uh, bobbin in through this there's a big hole here and then it narrows into a slot so the idea is you feed it through the hole and then you push it into the slot slot and basically the skirts on either side of the ceramic get trapped by the slot so what I'll do is I'll take some measurements of the ceramic and also the slot it has to go into and I'll also take some measurements of the uh, the bolt as well that goes through it this brass bolt assembler now I'm sure all the nuts and bolts and fasteners and hole sizes on this they're all going to be uh, imperial and uh, yeah I'm afraid I don't really do imperial uh, <laughs> never really figured it out to be honest I'm very much a metric boy um, so if this is something odd like 16 11 42s or something <laughs> we're going to be struggling aren't we because i only do metric right i'm just taking this piece of retaining wire out which uh yeah it what it does is it just holds the um just holds the ceramic in its slot and stops it coming back through the hole that you thread it through uh, and all it is is it just looks like it's a thin piece of bent wire Okay, we've, we've got that piece of wire out now. So I'm hoping we'll just be able to pull this along and slip it out of its hole. So this is the little pot insulator that we broke, or I've broken. And uh, I'm not sure, to be honest, I did break it. I think it might already have been damaged to start with. So when you put this in and out, you probably observed it when I did it. But the idea is that 
basically it's wider at the top and it's wider at the bottom so i think you would call that a bobbin shape wouldn't you so oh bugger dropped it bugger dropped it the sod's line i'm going to stand on it looking for it you know what i thought that was gone for good then i thought that was definitely going to go okay back again back in the room <laughs> yeah so yeah you can see it's kind of bobbin shape and the bits broken off there so it should kind of look like that and the idea is that basically there's a there's a big hole here and then there's a slot and basically the um it's narrow in the middle it's got a narrow waist and then it's got um oh what would you call it i don't know what's the correct term for that i'm trying to think of the words it has kind of skirts that stick out on either side that stick out wider so in the middle of it, it's got a narrow diameter and then it's wider at each end. So what you would do is you, you put it through this hole and then you can actually slide it along, slide it into this slot here. And once it's in the slot, it's too wide to come out or it would be if I hadn't broken half of it off. So that's what we're trying to recreate. But really, any type of ceramic that we can um, basically trap in here, any kind of ceramic pot, we can we can probably you know we can probably do something with that. I'm sure we'll be able to fettle something up. And at the moment, I've just I've broken two of these, and uh, yeah, so we're gonna have to repair two of them. I did see that there is some of these heaters for sale on eBay at the moment. But they're um, one's fifty pounds and the other one is sixty pounds. And to be honest, I didn't really feel like feel like paying fifty or sixty pounds just to get some spare beads. Because the reality is, I'd then have yet another heater, which uh, I'd be then concerned about restoring or throwing away or scrapping it. And uh, to be honest, I don't really want this one that much, so I don't want another. But I'm sure we'll be able to come up with a solution to this. Right, pens and papers at ready because. Uh, I think we'll, we're gonna we need to take some measurements down now so it's probably not that important but the bolt that goes through the middle of it is uh let's just check there zeroed probably near enough right okay in i'm on metric at the moment but i will do a conversion so it looks like this diameter this bolt that goes through is 3.3 millimeters and if we just uh, diameter 3.3 millimeters in diameter and we'll just convert that to inches which is uh, 130 thou so 130 thousandths and I'm sure that probably means something in these bizarre you know inch things 1632s or, uh, god knows I don't know so uh, 130 thou in old money or 3.3 millimetres diameter in new money. Right, let's just measure the outer skirt diameter. Which, as I say, it varies. Nine point seven five mil. So, so this is the outer skirt diameter. Nine point nine five there. So effectively, it's about ten mil in it. The outer diameter of this insulator. Let's just put that in imperial for those playing in imperial, which is three hundred and seventy-eight thou. Right, but the important thing is the uh, is the waist section, because that has to actually slide into the the groove in there. So I wonder if I can measure the groove. I don't think I can really get these in. Oh, maybe. It looks like the slot that's in here that this thing get has to be trapped in is 263 foul, put that into millimetres, or 6.69 mil. 
So I'm just measuring now the narrowest part of the waist of the little ceramic bobbin and that's giving, me, giving us a reading of 6.87 millimetres or 270 fowl. So hopefully we should have all the measurements we need now. Let's just measure the thickness of that. The thickness is 7 mil. It's not critical at all really this thickness. Um, I wonder if I could measure the uh, measure that bit there. Okay, approximately. Can you see what I'm measuring there? Approximately 2.38 millimeters, or 93 fowl. What I'll do to make it a little bit easier, I will actually write all these things down on a on a piece of paper, so that um, it makes it a little bit more obvious. It's funny when I measured this slot earlier, it seemed to be the slot seemed to be smaller than the actual um, waist of the bobbins, but it's quite hard to get in here. So the slot looks as though it's about 7mm, so does that fit in there now? Yeah, it's quite a tight fit that. So the actual slot that this goes into here is, the, 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 the slot is 7mm and the waist is, um, well it's close, 69 Some of the dimensions really aren't that critical. And as long as we can get the bolt through the centre and get some insulation on either side of that bolt, it doesn't really matter exactly what type of uh, ceramic insulator we end up with. And I did have a quick look and saw there was a few different varieties on, on eBay. And some of them look fairly close, as though they might do. I'm not sure if this is going to come out very well on camera, but you can see the big hole there that you have to feed the ceramic through. So basically you push it through where the hole is widest and then you slide it into the groove and now it's in theory it would be trapped if half of the bottom of this wasn't broken off. So that's how it's retained and then to stop it sliding back there's that piece of wire there which just goes wraps around and goes through a hole in the frame. So hopefully that, that's obvious. Yeah, we, I'm sure we, we're going to find something to fettle that, aren't we? It shouldn't be a problem. That's just me being a drama queen. This is the, uh, the knob that was on the radio, and it was actually just held on with some hot melt glue, which is lucky, really, because I um, all I needed to do was put my heat gun in the back of the radio, and I just heated it up, and uh, it just fell off. And it, it did leave a little bit of glue behind, and all I did was, again, heated the plastic up. And then I just went round it with a piece of uh, cloth with a bit of WD-40 on it. And basically what that does is it kind of contaminates the glue with oil. And uh, then basically it won't stick to the Bakelite anymore. And you can just you can just scrape the, uh, the, the remains of the glue off quite easily. So it came off and it's actually quite a nice knob that. So uh, somebody somewhere must probably know what type of radio this is off or what piece of equipment. And it's got a nice big arrow on it and it's actually quite heavy so come on who knows what that's off somebody somewhere must know what piece of equipment and has a knob on it like that that has got a lovely little arrow shape on so where's that come from it's 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 uh, again it's manufactured from bakelite and it's got a you know it's got a grub screw in the back and it's got a brass insert and uh yeah it's really really quite a nice knob that it almost, you know, it does kind of suit it. I mean, I could almost just reuse that. And uh, the only problem is you wouldn't be able to uh, tighten the grub screw up because it's actually in set. You wouldn't be able to get at it. So, yeah, we won't be able to use it. But this is the old, uh, this is the old switch that was actually inside it. And uh, my plan is to reuse this. I think it says it's an 8 amp rating. And uh, I think we looked at that on, on part one of the video. But I quite like that. I quite like the big, uh, the big clunk. Let's see if you can show you it working a bit better. Okay. 
Not sure I can hold this so you can see it. It actually feels very positive. It has a an absolute beautiful click action on it. You know, it's all spring loaded inside. Whoever whoever designed this in 1930, they knew really knew the job when it came to designing switches. It kind of uh, you press it and it doesn't move, and all of a sudden the uh, the spring must kind of just go over centre, and it just bam wangs across, bang. It's fantastic that, and uh, it's got great big. Um, a big piece of porcelain which slides between the uh, contacts there. I guess that will just make sure you've definitely quenched any arc. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. There's kind of a wall of uh, porcelain. Can I, can I show you? I don't think I can get the camera in. But, but basically there, inside there. So that, that piece of porcelain there separates one side of the switch to the other. So basically that's one switch. That's one of the switch contacts and that's the other switch contact. And this piece of metal in the middle just bridges from one side to the other. So that's how it works. And I think this is a G yes, this is a GEC switch as well. So I keep getting you out of contact out of camera there. So so I think that so what we've got on this switch it says it's a uh, five to I think that says five to eight amps. It's two hundred and fifty volts and it's got the GEC badge on it. Oh, it's got a bit more information in the back. Uh, oh, it's London. And it's got the British patent numbers on it there. It's got loads of numbers on it, actually. I don't know if we'll be able to see any of them, but it's got lo loads of patent numbers on the back. Uh, GEC. It's also got patents abroad. Made in England. And it says it's got the word vitreous on, on the bottom of it. So I'm guessing that's like vitreous enamel, is it? And again, like everything else, it looks as though you can pull this switch apart. It's got a um, terminal, it's, it's got mounting screws, uh, not mounting screws, it's got assembly screws. I can see inset within the porcelain. And it even looks as though with the correct tool you could remove these terminals as well. So, yeah, I mean, again, clearly been designed with maintainability and repairability. I mean, uh, when you bought a heater, and you probably part, Probably, I wouldn't be surprised if it was something silly like a month's wages for somebody this thing. Uh, you know, they built them to last, didn't they? Joe was also giving me some advice um, about cleaning this up. And uh, I think it will clean up really well. It's, I think you, hopefully it's coming out on the camera how lovely that is. I think Joe was recommending uh, giving it a rub down with some Brasso. And we can give that a try. I'm kind of wondering though, will something like Brasso be a bit too aggressive? Because I don't really want to take the old finish off it. I'm, I may be thinking, would I be better just to re-wax it when we've done using, uh, I think you saw that, uh, oh, it wasn't antique wax, I forget what they call it. It's, it's that white, crystalline, ridiculously expensive wax that I've got a tub of that I used on some of the uh, the old oil lamps that I restored a while ago. Yeah, I've got some of that white crystalline wax, and I'm just wondering if I should uh, just buff it up with that. Because when I when I washed the old uh, asbestos off it the other day, I kind of, not jet washed it, but I had a hose pipe on it. And I think that I, um, I probably washed off, you know, a little bit of the, the finish. It's gone a bit dull in places, but you can see where it's still a bit greasy, maybe from, you know, the bit of oil I put on it. It's really coming up a treat, that, so... Uh, yeah, I think we could really make a nice job of that. I have to admit, though, I'm not really a big fan of Bakelite. I'm, a, I'm more, when it comes to radios, I'm more of a woody fan. You know, I like my woodies. I don't really like Bakelite. Now, having said that I don't like Bakelite, I actually don't mind this one, really. I think it, it'll clean up really nicely. And it makes me think that you could almost buy one of those GEC heaters off eBay for, well, I don't know if £50 would be worth it, but... Um, you know, you'd have a really nice cabinet. You could put a speaker in or something like that. If you, you know, if you wanted to uh, build yourself like a, a modern uh, radio, but basically in an old-fashioned case, it'd be quite good to use one of these as a donor. I guess you might have to do something with the knob. Maybe put the controls on the back or something. But uh, yeah. 
So what we're looking at here is the old thermal cutout, and I don't know if I detailed this previously in the other video. When I originally got the heater, this was kind of uh, soldered onto there, and because I didn't know any better, I was kind of pulling on it, because I thought it was a bimetallic strip, and I thought maybe it opened and closed, depending on how hot the heater element was. But what it, what it actually is, I think that's just a piece of spring steel, and it was soft soldered onto this piece of brass here to make a connection. And I'm guessing maybe they use some form of uh, low temperature solder. So the idea was if this heat, I guess if it tipped onto its front or if the fan stopped working, the heat would build up in the radio and it would melt the solder that was holding these parts together. And once it had melted the solder, that would just spring open and it would just break the contact from one side to the other. So this uh, effectively it's a thermal switch a thermal cutout and this was just wired in series with the uh, with the heater assembler I've also just know it's having run this motor in for a period of time now and put the lubrication on it it's um it's actually running a lot better it's you know quite free to move now it was a little bit stiff when we first switched it on i'm also wondering are they steel or brass i can't quite tell if it if it is brass, and I think some of the fan blades on, I've seen fan blades before that are brass. I'm just wondering if we could take that off and actually polish it up. It might look quite nice to look inside and see this finger polished up. Yeah, I'm not sure. Now, I know that a few people also commented how quiet the motor was and did I have the sound turned down or something, and I, and I didn't. The motor was actually pretty much silent running. The only thing you could hear was the... Uh, you know the fan blades cutting through the air the motor was silent and uh yeah i guess a real testament to um to old engineering 1938 engineering now i've got to admit while i was actually looking for this on ebay i saw some other um heaters industrial style heaters on ebay that um quite took my eye i don't remember them but you'll have probably seen them in old schools and old gymnasiums and maybe old workshops I, I seem to remember seeing them in places like that and they were like these huge brass they almost look like brass spotlights and they had a motor in them and the whole head of the heater would pivot round to blow hot air so basically you'd be shivering cold until the heater rotated and uh, it would blow hot air on you for a second and then you'd be freezing cold again while you were getting changed and they'd probably like have one of these trying to heat up the whole of the um, the whole of the changing room in uh, at your school or you know wherever you went and played five a side football in some you know dilapidated cow shed of an outbuilding they tend to have one of these frigid little miserable heaters uh, well they weren't I guess they weren't that miserable three kilowatts and uh, I kind of had my eye on them I thought well I'll mind one of them they almost do start they almost look a bit arty so uh, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe we'll start buying more heaters. And until next time, that'll do. Bye for now. Ooh, bugger.